Today, we're in the city of Montgomery, Alabama, where we begin an eight-day crusade this afternoon at five o'clock. The city of Montgomery is one of the most attractive cities in the entire South. It has giant shade trees along its beautiful streets and historical homes with spacious grounds and gardens. The state capital is also one of the most beautiful in America, standing on Goat Hill amid giant trees at the head of Dexter Avenue. In 1817, Andrew Dexter of Massachusetts laid out three settlements called New Philadelphia, Alabama Town, and East Alabama. They were all consolidated in 1819 and called Montgomery in memory of General Richard Montgomery, one of the great heroes of the Revolutionary War. During the Civil War, Montgomery became the capital of the Confederate States of America. It was here that Jefferson Davis lived and directed the southern states during the Civil War a hundred years ago. Thus, Montgomery is often called the cradle of the Confederacy. Even today, the Confederate flag flies proudly above the state capitol as a symbol of the heroic efforts of the southern states to secede from the American Union a century ago. I was born and reared in the southern part of the United States. After I entered the field of evangelism, my wife and I could have lived in any part of the country that we desired because most of my life would be traveling. We chose to live in the South. During the past few years, the South has been undergoing a gigantic economic and social revolution. It is one of the most exciting places in the entire world. I agree with Walter Ruther, the president of the United Automobile Workers of America, when he recently said that the South is making faster progress than any other part of America. Standing here in Montgomery today, my own heart is stirred. My two grandfathers fought for the Confederacy. My grandfather on my mother's side was wounded at Gettysburg. He had his legs shot off and his eyes shot out, fighting for the cause of the Confederacy. Now, for me, a hundred years later, to come to this historic capital of the Confederacy and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ is indeed a thrill. At a press conference yesterday, a newspaper man asked me what will be the content of my message to the people of Montgomery. He asked this question in the light of the recent events here in this city that have made front page news around the world. When the Apostle Paul was asked that question hundreds of years ago, he said, I am determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul had an amazing confidence in the adequacy of the message he was commissioned to preach. In Paul's day, Corinth was one of the famous cities of the world. It was a central point of contact between East and West. Through the gateways of that city, the flood tide of the world's busy life swept daily. Its inhabitants represented all races. It was cosmopolitan, and men of all nations jostled each other in the streets. In Corinth, you could meet with the intellectuals discussing the latest problems of speculative philosophy. In Corinth, you could see temples and shrines erected to the gods, thronged with eager worshippers and ruled over by priests who were steeped in idolatry and superstition. Material luxury could be seen on every hand, side by side with evidences of sensuality, debauchery, and sex obsession. The sins of Corinth were similar to the sins of the Western world at this hour. In Corinth, sin vaunted itself openly and unashamedly. Philosophy walked hand in hand with vice, and the culture of the day was a companion of moral corruption. The word Corinthian in modern literature still connotes a fashionable type of immorality. It still denotes a man who has the outward appearance of a gentleman, but inwardly is morally corrupt. It was also a city of terrible social justice. One out of every five people that the Apostle Paul met in the streets was a slave. Many times the slave owners were cruel. Some were sadistic, torturing the slaves. As Paul looked at the moral debauchery on the one side and the social evil of slavery on the other, he must have been filled with righteous indignation. He wanted to scream against such evil and warn men of the judgment of God. Into the city of Corinth, the Apostle Paul had entered one day, dusty and travel-worn, friendless and unknown. He was the ambassador of Jesus Christ, and here was a stronghold of sin and paganism. How was he to gain the ear and win the hearts of its inhabitants? What power could subdue their pride, deliver them from bondage, and cleanse them from moral corruption, and change the social pattern of their lives? 
There were two methods that Paul could have used to attract attention and gain influence. The first was what Paul describes as excellency of speech. He could get up on a soapbox as a public orator and by the attractive persuasiveness of speech gather a number of followers because Paul was a great orator. He could proudly gain personal influence and even wealth for himself. This would have appealed to the intellectual Corinthians. He could win their admiration by the devices of language, weaving thought, feeling, and utterance into oratorical persuasiveness. The second method that Paul could have used would have been the cult of human wisdom, the attractive displays of philosophy and intellectualism. There was nothing that the Corinthians loved more than to discuss some new thing. The latest problem of thought, the most recent speculation about God and the world. Paul was well versed in philosophy and he was well qualified to assume the office of a teacher. However, Paul had learned that the world by wisdom knew not God. He knew that philosophy was bankrupt without a moral dynamic and a redeeming power. Thus, Paul rejected both methods as inadequate to the purpose he had in mind of changing Corinth. Where could Paul find power adequate to cope with man's needs? Where could he find the power that could reach down to the region of motive, purpose, and intent and energize the will and permanently change the lives of people? When men are enmeshed in evil habit, the slaves of passion and self-will, the victims of idolatry and superstition, where is the power which can break their fetters, shatter the chains of bondage, and set them free? That was the supreme question for Paul, as it is the supreme question of our modern world. And Paul gave a dynamic answer. It is an amazing answer that is scoffed and laughed at by many modern intellectuals, as it was by most intellectuals in Corinth 2,000 years ago. Paul said, For I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The source and secret of all regenerating power, of all spiritual dynamic, both for the individual and for society, is to be found in Christ and His cross, and the fact that God has raised Him from the dead. It is the cross and the resurrection that is the heart of the kerygma. It is the cross and the resurrection that the early apostles preached and turned their world upside down. It was this message that Paul determined to declare in the heart of pagan Corinth. Thus Paul began his work of proclaiming Jesus Christ in the midst of paganism. How did the Corinthians receive his gospel? To the Jews it became a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, it was foolishness. Many laughed at his message as sheer folly. It was to them arrogant nonsense, and they rejected it with scorn. However, Paul kept on, because he was convinced that it was God's will through the foolishness of preaching to save those that would believe. It was not long before hundreds and even thousands had been transformed by the power of the message that Paul preached. The church became so powerful that the city of Corinth itself became the gateway of Christianity in its westward march. Thus, in the center of complete corruption, in the stronghold of paganism, the word of the cross became the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believed. It was this message of the cross that transformed John Newton from a dealer in slavery to the man who could write, Amazing Grace! that saved a wretch like me. It was the message of the cross that transformed Augustine from a sensual playboy to the mighty saint that the church today acclaims. It was the message of the cross that transformed my own life and changed me from a selfish, rebellious teenager into a man with purpose and meaning in his life. It is true that today we have far more knowledge about our world than was available to Paul 2,000 years ago. Yet in spite of all our advance in knowledge, the one great need of man is a knowledge of spiritual reality. Man's deepest needs are moral and spiritual and can only be met by the saving power of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. What our generation needs more than anything else is the preaching of that gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. There is nothing else adequate to meet the crying needs of humanity at this hour except Christ Him crucified and raised again. 
The interpretation of that gospel to the spiritual needs of the modern world is the challenging task and supreme privilege of the ambassador of Christ. No wonder the apostle Paul said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The apostle Paul told the Galatians that he could tickle their ears by preaching good works and would suffer no persecution. He said his persecution came when he began to preach the cross. He said in Galatians 5.11, and I, brethren, if I yet preach works, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Then he added, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Three weeks ago, I stood in the beautiful Scandinavian city of Copenhagen, Denmark, and proclaimed Christ and Him crucified. We saw a mighty spiritual breakthrough as hundreds of Danes came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Today, I stand in the city of Montgomery, Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy, and shall proclaim this same message. And I believe this week, hundreds of people of the state of Alabama are going to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is this message that can transform your life, change your family, and change your community. Christ and Him crucified and risen again is the message of this hour that has power to transform and change. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that many this day will receive Christ as Lord, Master, and Savior, come to that cross, and have their lives changed by the dynamic power that God has put in the message of the cross and resurrection of Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen. The debate at the United Nations holds the spotlight of world attention as the nations once more try to find a road to peace. There is not much optimism that a permanent solution to the Middle Eastern crisis can be found. The Bible predicts that at some future point in history, the nations of the world will gather in the Middle East for at least two historic battles. The Battle of the Valley of Jehoshaphat and the Battle of Armageddon. Many biblical scholars think we are seeing the shuffling on the stage for the last great events of history. Certainly every Christian should be watching, expectant, working, sacrificing, praying, and prepared for these historic events that are unfolding daily before our eyes that could be the prelude to the coming again of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In spite of world pessimism concerning the possibilities of world peace, the Bible says that we are to seek peace and pursue it. God has said, I am for peace, but man is for war. God would like for man to enjoy the tranquility of world peace, but as long as man's nature is corrupted by sin, it is impossible. When Christ came to earth, he was called the Prince of Peace. But in announcing his coming, the angel said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Notice that the glory to God in the highest preceded peace on earth. Until the nations of the world are willing to give Christ his rightful place, there will be no peace. In fact, Christ warned that there will be wars and rumors of wars until the day of his appearing. All of life testifies that there is a conflict of the ages that penetrates every generation regardless of color, race, or creed. Good and evil can never be equated. As long as the principle of sin exists in the world, the eternal conflict will continue to rage. This world, with its contrasting and conflicting forces, is a gigantic battlefield of flashing swords and mortal combat. Lawlessness is in conflict with the lawful. The world of intrigue and dishonesty is in conflict with truth and honesty. The world of intolerance is at odds with tolerance and human understanding. The world of lust and pleasure is in conflict with propriety and purity. The world of godlessness is at odds with the world of godliness and righteousness. Disorder is at war with decency and order. We must conclude that we live in a world of unending conflict. Little wonder then that Christ said, I am come not to send peace but a sword. He was saying in effect that the symbol of life is not an olive branch or a palm leaf but a sword. He did not gloss over the facts of life but face them realistically. He was saying to his disciples, this is war, prepare yourselves for battle. 
true, his sword never dripped with blood. For when Peter wielded a sword of steel against Malchus, Jesus said, He that uses the sword shall perish with the sword. So the sword that Jesus places in the hands of his soldiers is not one that plunders, maims, and kills. It is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But even though it is a weapon of spiritual dimensions, it pierces, divides asunder, subdues its foes, and lays waste the powers of darkness. Thus the whole world is a battlefield. Even the Christian who has taken Christ the Prince of Peace in his heart finds little rest from spiritual conflict. The Bible specifically mentions three enemies of the Christian, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They are combined to form a powerful foe to defeat and frustrate God's plan and purpose in the lives of men. The world is Satan's ground force, making its attack on the horizontal level. The flesh is the subversive force, working from within to sap us of divine strength and effectiveness. The devil is the power and prince of the air and represents a diabolical air core which bombards the Christian continually in an all-out effort to defeat our Christian offensive. These satanic forces are graphically described in Ephesians in these words, wherein in times past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. First, the Bible teaches the world is at war with the spiritually minded Christian. Worldliness is a mood, a tempo, and an attitude of soul which peers out horizontally upon life. Its head is never lifted upward in recognition to God. Its gaze is manward, never Godward. It is that materialistic, sensual view of life which centers its attention on the gratification of the lower appetites and desires, completely blind to the things of the Spirit. To this kind of world, God is not just denied, He is forgotten. The Christian is at odds and at war with this aspect of the world. It stoned the prophets, it burned the martyrs, it crucified Christ, and it still antagonizes people who dare to live apart from its philosophy and power. The Bible warns that we are to love not the world, neither the things that are of the world. The Bible again warns that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Thus the Christian finds himself in mortal daily conflict with the world round about him. And he is not to yield an inch. Secondly, the flesh is at war with the Christian. Spell the first four letters of the word flesh backwards and you have the word self. The word flesh is the biblical word for our old nature, the nature of sin. The apostle Peter, who knew a great deal about the struggle with the flesh, said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. The flesh is the enemy within, the spiritual fifth columnist. Our old nature, even though it has been subdued to a degree by the Spirit of God which dwells in the Christian, cries for self-expression. Thus the Christian finds that his greatest conflict is oftentimes with himself. In spite of the fact that you have come to Christ, the Bible teaches that the old nature with all of its corruption is still there and that these evil temptations come from within. In other words, a traitor is living within. That wretched bent toward sin is ever present to drag you down. War has been declared. You now have two natures in conflict and each one is striving for the victory. The Bible teaches the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. It is the battle of the self-life and the Christ-life. The old nature cannot please God. It cannot be converted or even patched up. However, the scripture does give great hope in this conflict. When Christ died, he took you with him to the cross. And the old nature can be made inoperative. And you can reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin by faith. And victory can be obtained. Paul said he had no confidence in the flesh. On another occasion he said, I make no provision for the flesh. On another occasion he said, I keep my body under. We are to so completely yield and surrender ourselves to God that we can by faith reckon the old nature dead indeed unto sin. The third enemy that the Christian has is Satan. He is out to defeat the Christian. He well knows that the child of God is a dangerous enemy to his cause. He made every effort to tempt and defeat Christ. Today he concentrates on Christ's followers. He is the commander-in-chief of the powers of evil and his main attack is launched against those who have taken sides with Christ. 
He harasses, he accuses, he tempts, he devours, he deceives, he lies, he murders, he tempts. He works through his allies, the world and the flesh, to work havoc in the church, to hinder the progress of righteousness, to discourage and distress the Christians, and to weaken the Christian offensive. The Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He is a powerful foe who is called the God of this world, the Prince of this world, and the Prince and the power of the air. While the scripture teaches that we are not to love the world and we are to make no provision for the flesh, the scripture teaches we are to stand up and resist the devil and he will flee from us. We are not to give place to the devil. We are not to kowtow and run from him. But before that, God says, submit yourselves to God. If you have fully submitted yourself completely to Christ, then you can resist the devil. And the Bible promises he will flee from you. The devil will tremble when you pray. He will be defeated when you quote or read a passage of scripture to him. These then are our three foes. The devil, the world, and the flesh. Our attitude toward them as Christians can be summed up in one word. Renounce. There can be no bargaining, compromise, or hesitation. Absolute renunciation is the only possible course to a Christian seeking complete victory. In relation to the devil, we resist him only as we submit ourselves to God. In relation to the world, the Bible says, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. In relation to the flesh, the Bible says, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yes, there is glorious news to those of you that are fighting these battles and temptations. You're not asked to fight the battle alone. The Bible says in Romans 8, 13, that you by the spirit shall put to death the deeds of the body. Remember Christ promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Jesus promised after he left the earth he would send another, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who is called a comforter, which actually means one that helps alongside that he may abide with us forever. It is this Holy Spirit living within us that produces the peace of God in our hearts in the midst of the struggles of life. This is a peace the world cannot know. It is only known to the child of God. This peace that God gives is based upon our faith in Him. The Christian does not pretend to believe. He does not half believe. He does not believe today and doubt tomorrow. He believes. He believes that the hairs of our head are numbered and that not even a sparrow falls to the ground but that the Father knows. He believes that the universe is in keeping of infinite wisdom and infinite love. In ways he cannot fully understand, he believes that God directs the course of history and cares at the same time for each individual soul. Thus, during this critical period of world history, the Christian knows that nothing can happen in the universe but by the permission of God. No scientific research can damage the framework of God's plan. Man's freedom is real but limited. He cannot extinguish the stars, pluck the sun from the sky, prevent the return of spring, quench a mother's love, or defeat the divine purposes revealed forever at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, when the Christian looks at the conflicts and wars around him and within him, there is peace because he has faith in the Prince of Peace. He is able to say, whate'er events betide, thy will they all perform. Thus, as we stand in the midst of a crucial United Nations debate, the true Christian is the only person in the world that has complete optimism that the future is in God's hands and in the midst of the conflicts of life, he has peace. Do you know today this peace that comes from God? First, there must be peace with God. You can make your peace with God today by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ as Savior. He died on the cross to purchase your peace. He shed his blood that you might have forgiveness of sin. But before you can have the peace of God and the peace from God, you must have peace with God. And you will only find peace with God at the foot of the cross. Therefore I call upon you today to repent of your sins and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you can have the peace that God has promised to all of those that are members of the body of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ.
President Johnson's sober address to the press last Wednesday has caused buried reactions throughout the world. There is no doubt that the vast majority of the American people support the president's policy of no further retreat in the face of naked communist aggression in the form of guerrilla warfare in Southeast Asia. Thus, our reckless Asian communism rushes headlong into the yawning abyss of war. Defiant, godless humanity has tasted the wrath mentioned in Jeremiah 25, and governments and people are reeling to and fro, mad because of the sword I will send among them, said the prophet. At this moment in China, there is a loose and ungovernable passion to kill, leading to mass murder and mass suicide and all kinds of atrocities. A group of psychiatrists meeting in Europe a few days ago issued a statement in which they said, there is in the world a mentality which entails grave dangers to mankind, leading to a war psychosis. These psychiatrists did not realize it, but they confirmed God's warnings of many centuries ago. God had said through Jeremiah the prophet, For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel unto me, Take this cup of the wine of wrath at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it, and they shall drink and reel to and fro, and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then Jeremiah the prophet continued in his prophecy, Ye shall surely drink, for lo, I begin to work evil at the city which is called by my name. And should ye Gentile nations be utterly unpunished, ye shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith Jehovah of hosts. Has the world been given this drink? If so, the end is very near. The accumulated evidence of the universal insanity which manifests itself in a mad desire for war on the part of some nations is so vast that only a few of the outstanding items could be given at this hour. The newspapers are filled with talk of war throughout the world. A European prime minister said the other day, I feel that I'm living in a madhouse. Another European leader said, the world is becoming like a lunatic asylum run by lunatics. There is no doubt that dangerous economic conditions, in addition to the military, are fast becoming one of the major problems of the Western world. By autumn, the British will be faced with the tragic possibility of devaluation of the pound, and this will have economic repercussions throughout the world. Many nations are on the border of financial collapse. For example, there is Colombia in South America, where almost a full-scale war is going on in the mountains between the government forces and the forces controlled by Castro. Colombia is on the verge of economic collapse in spite of its many natural resources. In fact, Colombia could be one of the richest nations in the world. It is the feeling of many that the present social order cannot be maintained. Many nations in the world are pursuing a policy which, if continued, will bring about political, economic, and military suicide. This policy must sooner or later bring great distress to all countries, and revolutionary conditions now prevail almost everywhere, even in the United States. War will be the inevitable consequence. War so disastrous that parts of the world will be reduced to chaos and ruin. This is no overdrawn picture. It is a true description of the situation as it exists today. The entire world is on the road to disaster without parallel in the history of the human race. In Matthew 16, there is recorded an incident in the life of Jesus Christ regarding the signs of the times. The scriptures say, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say that it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Jesus taught that just before his second coming, there would be signs to indicate that his coming was near. One of these signs would be universal war madness. I have just written a book entitled World Aflame, 
that will be in bookstores from coast to coast beginning September 6th. In this book, I have listed many of the signs that will precede the coming of Jesus Christ back to this earth again. Many scholars will laugh at this interpretation of the scriptures, yet there is a clear biblical precedent. As clear as the signs were in the days of our Lord's first coming, there were some who were utterly blind to their meaning. And there's a deadly parallel in our own day. We still have with us the religious and political leaders who cannot see the things they ought. They can trace the course of the stars in the heavens. They can send a mariner 6,000 miles from Mars. They can send a Gemini around the world for four days. They can even tell you many of the intricate secrets of the universe. But they cannot find the path of God in human history. They can do fairly well with the weather, predicting if it will be fair or foul. But in spiritual judgment, they say fair when they should say foul. And they sometimes say foul when they should say fair. Christ was not rebuking those who sincerely seek to know the signs of the times. It is true that Jesus said a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But the wickedness of that generation did not consist in seeking after a sign. They were wicked because they asked for another sign after they had already been given hundreds of signs and it turned their backs upon all of them and they were filled with unbelief concerning the word of God. They were condemned for willful blindness, for following their own lust and ambitions and passions instead of believing the word of God. Thus the crisis in our world this week does not take God by surprise. It is obvious to any thoughtful person that, humanly speaking, there is little room for optimism. The war in Southeast Asia is escalating and could be the beginning of World War III, which could end with a nuclear exchange and destroy much of civilization. Most of us as individuals can do very little to alleviate the great conflicts and pressures which exist in our world. Even if the world leaders should ask me, I could not possibly provide them with a sudden panacea or a cure for the terrible problems facing our world, except the cure that Jesus Christ offers when he said ye must be born again. Man's nature must be changed before we can change the passions of men that lead to war. Most of us can do little in the present situation except to pray. However, to those of us who know the scriptures, we recognize that in the Bible there is an analysis of the causes behind all this trouble. The basic difficulty is that the world has rejected the Bible as the word of God. The world has rejected Christ as the Son of God. The world has rejected the morality and the ethics taught in the Bible. Millions attending church this morning on both sides of the Atlantic and the Pacific have no idea what a personal relationship with Jesus Christ means. They serve God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. The Bible says that this present world order is under the rule of Satan. We recognize the sinister hand of the devil behind many of the movements that are contrary to the Christian faith. The Bible teaches that God, who has judged nations of the past, will not always tolerate the indifference and wickedness of men. We are living in a world ripening for judgment. As we see the rampant wickedness on every side, we cry out with Habakkuk the prophet, O oh Lord, how long? Why does the Lord tolerate the rising tide of evil? In our newspapers we read of nothing but rape, murder, passion, greed, hate, lust, and war. The president has appointed a blue ribbon council to study the causes of crime. The basic cause of crime is sin. The reason that the world has not fallen before now in judgment is that God is still waiting for men and women to come to him. He is not willing that any should perish. There are yet others whom Christ desires to win to a personal faith in his son Jesus Christ. This is why evangelism is so important in the present situation. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth again and only in Christ will the world find permanent peace. One of the signs of his soon coming is the lack of peace in the world. The Bible predicts that as we approach the end, there will be greater military tension. The conflict that we've called the Cold War is now becoming hotter. The world today is an armed camp surpassing anything the world has ever known. Never before have such massive armaments been at the disposal of military forces. Humanly speaking, the only factor preventing a world eruption at this hour is the balance of terror between America and Russia. 
How about there is a new situation now emerging that the President has been trying to remind us. China has nuclear weapons and will soon have the capability to deliver those weapons to any part of the world. France has nuclear weapons, so does Great Britain. Other nations, such as Indonesia and Egypt, are frantically working on their own nuclear power. It will not be long before many nations, perhaps even Cuba, have these nuclear weapons, and some of these fanatic dictators are going to use them. The Bible plainly forecasts the coming of yet another great war. It will be a war to eclipse anything the world has ever seen. It will embrace all nations of the world, and its focal point will be in the Middle East, where the armies of the world will deploy themselves centering at Mount Megiddo. This great battle has been called the Battle of Armageddon, and in the midst of this terrifying war that could destroy civilization, the Lord Jesus Christ will return to this earth in glory and power to judge the nations of the world and set up his own glorious kingdom. The scriptures describe this great battle in the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation. The sixth angel will pour out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. We are told that the waters of the Euphrates River will be dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The dry riverbed will permit unhindered passage of the great armies of the east to the scene of battle. Unclean spirits will go out into the world to the kings of the earth to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. The armies of the world will focalize on a point known as Armageddon, the Mount of Megiddo, and there the final world conflict will take place. The extent of this conflict is indicated in the ninth chapter of Revelation, where the army is to cross the Euphrates River, is described. And in that chapter, the immensity of this final world war is carefully described. As we read the screaming headlines of the past week, we are aware of the shuffling of the stage in preparation for the greatest battle of all time. The crisis of the present hour should shatter the optimism of every person listening to my voice. The only reliable hope for the future must be bound up in a living faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. President Johnson spoke this past week of the dreams and hopes of the American people for the future. Yes, we have dreams and hopes, but there is not much optimism that they will be fulfilled because human nature being what it is, is erupting all over the world with greed, passion, hate, murder, rape, and all the rest. As we stand on the threshold of these climactic events of the next few years, we hear again the words of the prophet Amos, prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared to meet God? If not, you can prepare today. You can prepare by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. How do you do that? Repent of your sins. Receive him as your savior. It is an act that can be done right this minute. Riding in your car, you can bow your head and say yes to Christ. Sitting in your living room, wherever you may be hearing this broadcast, anywhere in the world, whatever your color or race, whatever your background, Come just as you are to Jesus Christ. He will forgive the past. He will adopt you into his family. You will become a child of God. And God's life will be yours. And when the world erupts, you will be saved. Because God is going to save all of those who put their trust and confidence in his son, Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, in Jesus' name, we pray that thy Holy Spirit will speak to those who have listened today. Convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. We pray also for the President of the United States and the leaders of the world as they seek for a way out. Oh God, we pray that they will come to realize that the only way out is in the cross of Jesus Christ and that they will come and receive him as their Lord, Master, and Savior. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. One of our newspapers this past week carries an editorial summing up the state of the nation. It says there is optimism on the one hand, but criticism, discontent, and fear on the other hand. Then it charges that little is being done by the average person to remedy the situation. I heard about a doctor the other day who criticized the government's failure to solve the problems in Africa.
that when he was asked if he would be willing to go to Africa as a doctor in public health work, he scoffed at the idea. The average American wants a better world, a perfect society, and world peace without any genuine effort of personal sacrifice on his part. Why do you attend church was a question asked recently in a survey made in Ohio among rural families. According to the Rural Sociological Society which made this study, one-fourth of the churchgoers said they seldom miss church because they know the members. Others said it was the friendly atmosphere of the church. Others said they liked the fellowship. Or they went from a sense of duty or habit. Fewer than 20% mentioned the sermon as a reason for going, while 3% said it was the music and singing, and 2% admitted they attended to show off their clothes. Strangely enough, the members failed to give the basic reason why Christians should go to church, namely to worship God. Less than 1% said that they went to church to worship God. We have become like the Pharisees of old, religious on the outside, but selfish, lazy, worldly, and sinful on the inside. We have become religious addicts without any real substance to our faith. An addict is one who imbibes, partakes, or indulges in a sedative or a stimulant for the purposes of obtaining momentary relief from reality. As boredom increases in America, the sale of alcohol and narcotics inevitably rises. The cocktail party has become almost a national institution. And as Elsa Maxwell, the noted party giver, is reported as saying recently, the cocktail party is strictly for people who are bored. But today, I'm thinking of the type of addiction that we seldom think of. Just as some people take dope or alcohol in order to feel better momentarily, many people have turned to religion for momentary relief from tensions and pressures. There are thousands of people who are non-religious all week, and then on Sunday for one brief hour, slip into a church or cathedral for a religious shot in the arm. It soon wears off, because on Monday morning, our religious guise is taken off and we put it away until the next Sunday. Thousands get some sort of conscious relief by having discharged their religious duty and paid superficially their respects to God. For a few three moments, they're saints. They have one hour of religious addiction. This is as far removed from the teachings of Christ as the East is from the West. There are millions of people who are members of the church and who attend with some regularity but it is nothing but religious pretense and addiction. Theirs is a blatant hypocrisy, even worse than that of the Pharisees of old. This type of hypocrisy has entered into every phase of American life. Many of our political leaders refuse to state their convictions in public. They say one thing in public, but their true convictions expressed in private are totally different. Christ dealt with this same problem 2,000 years ago. And in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, he scathingly denounced the Pharisees and the hypocrites. First, he deplored pretentious religion and indicated that it was nothing more than addiction. He said, Woe well, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Sincerity should be the hallmark of the Christian faith. It was born in the white heat of spiritual conflict and it will never be maintained by half-hearted, half-committed, halfway disciples. Paul's prayer for the church at Philippi was that they be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The Bible has no place for part-time Christianity. No Sunday one-hour addiction is tolerated in the Scriptures. The Scripture says that ye may be sincere without hypocrisy and without offense. The world has been offended and put off by our insincerity. The world has been misled by our insincerity and hypocrisy. This is one of the greatest stumbling blocks to evangelism in America today. Millions of Christians with religious pretense are building beautiful churches and institutions, but lacking in spiritual power, sacrifice, and dedication. With their lips they serve Christ, but their hearts are far from Him. They pretend to be something they're not. This may be one of the reasons why the percentage of the American population that belongs to churches has declined during the past year, according to statistics in the 1963 yearbook of the American churches published by the National Council of Churches. Protestant churches also reported a loss of 3% of the total Sunday school enrollment. Many people are beginning to ask, 
Have we reached the turning point in the so-called religious revival of the last 15 years? I would answer that, no. As I travel from one part of the country to the other, I find a deep hunger on the part of thousands of Christians for a moving of the Spirit of God that would bring about a true spiritual revival. Already there are indications that the Holy Spirit may be moving in mysterious ways throughout the nation. There are evidences of revival at Yale, Princeton, and other universities among small groups of students meeting for prayer and Bible study. In almost every city of the nation, there are small groups meeting in homes and in business establishments, praying together and studying the scriptures together. These people are sick and tired of the religious pretentiousness that exists in many of our churches. They are searching for a deeper walk of God and a greater understanding of the scriptures and a greater knowledge of prayer. The Bible teaches that the Christian is to be different, unique, and even peculiar. He is to stand out in sharp contrast from the crowd. But what is happening today in many of our churches? There is little difference between the Christian and the worldly man on the outside. The insider and the outsider are practically the same. In many cases, this stems back to our spiritual experience. There are millions of church members who have never really been born again. Let's face it. They've never been thoroughly converted to Christ. They believe with their heads, but their hearts have never been warmed with the tears of repentance in the act of commitment to Christ. They're like John Wesley, who even became a missionary to Georgia, but had never experienced the warm heart. There are others who have been born again of the Spirit of God, but have allowed their lives to drift. They yielded to the temptations of Satan and lost their fellowship with God. They've become cold and worldly. This is one of the reasons why many church leaders are calling for revival and renewal within the church. Secondly, Jesus declared that a religion that doesn't change a man on the inside is nothing but religious addiction. Woe well, unto you scribes and Pharisees, for ye may clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. And again he said, Ye indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. The heart of the natural man is filthy and needs the cleansing that only Christ can give. This was the teaching of Christ. The best man in the world without God is capable of the most terrifying crimes. Every day we read of people in our newspapers, sometimes professors of religion, who commit unthinkable crimes. In a survey taken some years ago in a southern penitentiary, it was found that 65% of the inmates were members of churches. According to the teaching of Christ, Religious pretense is not enough. Religious addiction is not enough. In fact, it can be dangerous. The fact that we have our name on a church roll may give us a sense of security religiously, but it's false. I warn you that any religious profession that does not change your habits, your attitudes, and your desires is as false as a $3 bill. It is not New Testament Christianity. It is nothing but religious addiction and pretense. And Jesus said, Except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Thirdly, Christ declared that any religion that does not impel us to share it with others is religious addiction and not Christianity. He said, Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither be in yourselves, neither suffer ye or allow them, that are entering to go therein. While communists are articulating their message and gaining disciples all across the world, we so-called Christians are all too often silent. I visited the opium dens of the Orient some years ago and have seen the addicts sprawled upon the dirty floor, where for a price they become dead to what is going on around them. I see much of the church today, prone in its apathy and silent in its expression, dead to what is going on around it. The church speaks out on many social problems as it should, but has been strangely silent on the moral problems that face the nation. It was said of German General von Maltek that he could be silent in seven languages. Christians should be vocal in at least one language. In the Old Testament, the story is told of a desperate famine during which four Syrian lepers decided to fall into the hands of the enemy in order to keep from starving. They decided to surrender. 
expecting arrest at any moment, they strolled through the enemy camp grabbing bits of food wherever they could find it. But to their dismay and surprise, no soldiers were near the camp. So the lepers sat down and gorged themselves into satisfaction. While they sat dozing from overeating, they remembered their families who were back home consumed with hunger. One of the lepers finally said, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Equal guilt must be shared by the Christian church in the midpoint of this century because we do not well. This is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. For nearly 2,000 years we've known the good news of salvation. Yet enjoying it for ourselves, we fail to propagate it. The fact that the church is committing the sin of silence is apparent almost everywhere. In one of our denominations, it takes the efforts of 65 members to win one person to the church during an entire year. In 1904, Lenin kept on preaching his communist sermon, a sermon that produced 17 converts. By 1917, these 17 had become 40,000. By 1933, their fold had swollen into the millions. So much so that in this year of 1963, there are over a billion and a quarter communists. Why do we take Christianity so lightly? You can watch a man's house burn down. You can stand there with your arms folded and not turn in the alarm and still be a law-abiding citizen. You can know that right next door or where you work or where you live, there is someone whose life is going to ruin. And you can do like Pilate. Wash your hands of the whole matter and not be condemned as guilty by your fellow citizens. You can be in a crowd where someone ridicules or even crucifies Christ or says vicious things about one of your closest friends and you can keep silent and still be respected. However, the Bible strongly warns that God will not hold him guiltless who commits the sin of silence. Karl Marx might have been referring to this sterile kind of faith when he called religion the opiate of the people. False religion is an opiate and a religion that makes people feel good for one hour in the week and doesn't make them be good and do good for the rest of the week could not by any stretch of the imagination be called true Christianity. God is not impressed by our weekly pilgrimages to his sanctuaries. God doesn't look on the mask that is over our faces, but he sees what is under it. He looks through the veil of pretense and sees our very souls when he looks at you. Does he see a heart that has been purged by the blood of Christ? Does he see a life that is conformed to his son's image? Does he see a heart that is sincere before him without the slightest shade of pretense? His x-ray eyes penetrate through our pious garments and see what we really are. Jonathan Edwards, former president of Princeton University, once wrote at the beginning of the year in his diary, Resolve first that every man should live always and everywhere at his highest and best for God. Resolve second, whether any man strives to be so or not, I will, so help me God. Not occasional addiction, but complete dedication to Christ is the answer to the world's dilemma and your dilemma. Your world could be turned upside down. Would you dare to be one of those in your community? Would you say with Jonathan Edwards if nobody else dedicates himself totally to Christ? By God's grace, I will. You can make that decision at this moment. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that we will not be religious addicts, but we pray that we shall be so completely yielded to Christ that His Spirit will shine through us, producing the fruit of the Spirit every day of the week. For we ask it in His name. Amen.